him in the air. So that's one. And also, just before he returns, um, God will shake the earth in such a way, he would shake every institution in such a way as a last-ditch effort to allow grace to come, to soften people's heart, sort of like a John the Baptist go to warn the people or to soften them up for, for Christ to come, to make his appearance. You see in these last days, every institution will fail. The way people did things before will fail because God is sort of shaking everything. So people will take their trust and allegiance off of the physical and to realize that they have to trust him, that he is the savior, that he is their father, that he is the way, that he is the truth, and that he is the life. If all of our institutions were to deliver based on what they promised, I'm talking about government, I'm talking about business, I'm talking about education, even the church as an institution to we realize it would fail in a sense because once we take the person of Christ out, out of the church and we make it all about church, the church will fail. And God was shaking even the churches and he's shaking every institution on the face of the earth so that people will transfer the allegiance from these institutions, which tries to deliver hope, uh, tries to deliver guidance, tries to deliver finance, tries to deliver knowledge, education. They will transfer the allegiance to God. And another thing that will happen in these last days, and, you know, Word and Spirit Assembly would, will experience this, is that God, there's a, a sort of resurgence of the gifts, a resurgence of the gifts of healing, uh, power gifts, you call them, so that people can walk and demonstrate the works of Christ. Because that becomes a major um, uh, witnessing tool or to add credibility to your message. Um, that's what the disciples did. They spoke about Jesus, but what added credibility to their message was a demonstration of the works of Christ, namely healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. So in these last days, not only is Christ's return is imminent, but he's also coming back for a glorious church that looks like him, that will walk like him, that will speak like him, a church that that nothing is impossible with them because they trust God. And last week we spoke about faith, and the Bible did really say in these last days, would he really find, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith on the earth? And I think in the last days, and my heart is saying this, there will be a big, we'll be able to tell distinctly, there will be a big difference between religious people mm -hmm. and people of power and might and faith. And what will separate one from the other, talking about Christians here, the body of Christ, what will separate one from the other is their level of faith and their faithfulness. Because in the Old Testament, remember, there's no word for faith in the Old Testament. It's faithfulness. And the idea we get is that the just, it's spoken of with the, the statement, the just shall live by faith, or faithfulness rather, was first in the Old Testament. The just shall live by faith, or the righteousness shall, the righteous shall live by their faithfulness. It indicates a prolonged, ongoing trust in who God is, that whether or not we get at what we've been praying for and hoping for, it doesn't matter because our faith is anchored on in the person of Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. One second. The light went on. There we go. So, in these last days, God is restoring his church. Not that he hasn't been restoring his church. Not that he... he, he People have decided to put Christ outside of the church. So now it's a grace. It's an anointing that's here. And if you are willing to partake of it, if you are willing to receive it, it, it's almost like the stream of the spirit, you know, like a river that flows from the throne room of God onto the earth. 
And it's a grace that allow anyone that steps in to begin to flow and operate like Jesus. And we may even see greater works in this time. So to the same extent, you would say things are getting bad. You ever talk to people and even Christians say things are getting bad, girl. Things are getting bad, boy. What are you going to do? Well, we have to pray. We have to pray. And you, and you would say the same thing all the time. But at the same time, when things are getting worse in the world, when things are shaken, it has to be shaken. It's going to get to the point where people have no hope in the world because that's God's grace. It's not a thing the devil is bringing bad things or causing bad things to happen. No, it's God allows certain things to happen because it's God's grace on people to not trust so they could eyes could open so they wouldn't trust the institution. They wouldn't trust to live by their own whim or their own ability or, or by the natural nature. They would begin to transfer their, their allegiance. They would look away for hope. And the only person that's left that offers that hope because of the Christians who live victoriously and not depressed and not in fear, but they live joyfully. They at rest and peace despite what's going on in the world. They would look at that and they would say, wow, indeed, you know, Jesus is real. And that gives them the ability to trust him, to trust God in these last days. So we should be excited that even though things are getting worse, at the same time, things are getting better for the children of God. But always remember of the increase of his government there shall be no end. Remember that's spoken about Jesus. And the kingdom of God is like that stone. Remember Daniel's vision. Uh, this, that stone that smashed that image. All the other kingdoms. And it was grounded to powder. And this stone, the kingdom, the chief cornerstone kept growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So the kingdom of God is going to perpetually expand is not going to shrink back. The reason why we don't hear about success stories in the kingdom of God and we don't realize we don't we don't realize that and it's it's being suppressed actually by the media, it's being suppressed where people are getting saved by the droves in the Middle East. Even though you hear about all the stuff in the Middle East and different parts of the world in North Korea or China, Afghanistan, and, and the, the eleven forty window out there, it's there are more salvations now than ever before. At the same time, there's more persecution now than before. Christians all over the world have been persecuted now more than ever before on the face of the earth. Africa, every country, Pakistan, India, Christ Christians are facing severe, severe persecution. But at the same time, they're growing. They're growing in the Lord. They're growing in power. They're growing in might. They're growing in wisdom. And they're also growing in numbers. The, the church... The underground churches, the saints who are meeting secretly, there are thousands and thousands of secret churches where people meet in houses and have times of worship and have encounters with God. God shows up mightily all over the world in all these gatherings in a mighty way. Um, we're just not privy to this information. But if you search it out, you will get it. Uh, good places, uh, Voice of the Martyrs, um, Persecuted Christians. Um, dot org, um, International Christian Concern, um, Open Doors. they all organizations that have a specific information about different um, people, groups, and places in the world that are suffering. Uh, people as Christians are suffering um, because of persecution. Now, how do we prepare for these last days? What do we do? We have to increase our faith. And how do we increase our faith? The Bible said faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. Now, we at this study, we do things a little bit deeper. So what is hearing? Hearing is auditory, right? Somebody speaks and you hear. Now, remember we always say that in our spirit, we don't need more of God in there because it's already set. It's filled with God. Our spirit is the walking word. Just like Jesus is the walking word. Okay? Our spirit is the walking word. When we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, our spirit which was in prison, which was dead to God. It was, even though it was alive, it was dead, basically, to God. When it comes to God, it comes to light. It was, it was like in darkness. Our spirit was like this world before Jesus came into it and said, let there be light. And when light came into our spirit, we came alive. 
And the way we came alive is that Jesus joined joined with our spirit. He said, let us come and make our home with them. So God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, namely the Holy Spirit, came to make his home in us. So God came to make his home in us through the Holy Spirit. And his life joined with our life. The two became one. We said that because we became a new creation, a new spirit. So in your spirit, that word is there in its fullness. Its word is in there limitless. The word is in you with power and with might. You are the walking word in your spirit. Now, why do we need to hear the word if we already fill with the word? Because of our soul. Our soul needs to be permeated with its soul. What is our soul? Our mind, our will, our emotions. And that's where we lack faith. We lack faith in our mind and our will and our emotions because we were conditioned by unbelief. And what is the opposite of faith? It's fear is the opposite of faith. Before Christ, we live a fear-based life. What does that mean? We had to do things in order to feel hopeful. If we didn't do anything, we'll be left in a place of despair. So we had to do in order to feel. But when we came to Christ, we became, so we no longer have to do to feel. What we do is a result of who lives in us. So we have that peace in there now that lives in us. And, and the perfect love of the Father came into our life. And what did it do? It eliminated fear. Perfect love drives out all fear. So instead of a fear-based life, now we have a, a faith-based life or a love-based life. A life full of trust. A love. A life full of full of boldness. Yeah, mute again, Pastor. Faith is because our soul lacks the faith-based life or lacks the love of the Father that when we hear it, it conditions our minds. It then conditions our conscience to what? To receive what the Spirit of God says about us, what the Spirit of God says about the Father. So what limits God is our preconditioning. And when we hear the truth, what happens and how it translates to faith is that we change our position. All of a sudden, it makes us conducive. It brings us in sync now with what the Spirit is saying. Remember, the Spirit is always speaking from the inside. But because we have a different operating system in our mind, our will, our emotions, we can't receive what the Spirit is saying from the inside. We can't receive the benefit of salvation which is the abundant life, the overcoming life, the ability to trust God despite how we feel or despite our circumstances. That's the normal Christian life, to trust God despite how we feel, to rejoice in everything, to be joyful even when you go through trials because you trust God. What is faith? To trust God. The reason why we lack faith and the reason why we, we, we don't trust God more or have, depend on him more or well, the reason why we don't have faith is because we have not been feeding ourselves the word of God, which creates in us that foundation or that operating system or that program that be able to assimilate truth where it becomes part of who we are. A lot of us, we are headstrong. We know what God says, but in our heart, we lack the conviction of the spoken word. What is conviction? Conviction is who you are. It's not what you believe. Conviction is who you are. What you believe has to, at some point in time, sink into your heart and become a conviction. And when it becomes a conviction, no matter what happens or what you think, you are your convictions. And faith needs to be part of our conviction. And what is faith? The a lack of faith is our inability to trust God. Our lack of faith is our inability to trust God. One statement that Peter spoke to Jesus, and Jesus was always chastising the disciples. You, you have little faith. Why you don't believe? Come on, believe, believe. You see me transfigured. Now it's time to believe. You see me feed the 5,000. Now it's time to believe. You see me heal the blind man. You see me raise Jairus' daughter. You saw all these things. Now it's time to believe. And they still didn't believe. You see me walk on water. You didn't believe. You see me make gold coins come out of a fish's mouth, and you still don't believe. No matter if God appears and do all these miracles for you, the default, the human mind still wouldn't believe. So what do you do with this? We have to begin 
The only way I would say to increase your faith is begin to live from the spirit and perceive from the spirit. And we see this where Peter told Jesus when he said, when Jesus began to speak about his suffering and how he was going to die, Peter said, no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to do that. We'll fight you. And what did Jesus tell Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan, because you see things not from a spiritual eye. Uh, you see things in a natural way or the human way. You see things from the natural. So what does that tell me is that when we limit God or we see things in a natural way and we perceive limitations, God sees that no different than the demonic. Because what did you tell him? Because Peter saw things in a natural way and didn't want God to suffer, but didn't realize in a spiritual way he had to do that to pay the price for the sins of the world. Jesus chastised him and said, get away from me, Satan. Or get behind me, Satan, because you see things naturalistically. A lot of Christians live their Christian life in a naturalistic way. They live by what they see. They live based on their belief system, what they think should happen, what they think is going to happen, based on their provision, not knowing that every single time God showed us through Jesus Christ how to live by faith, and the way Jesus dealt with his disciples, you realize he was always having them attempt the impossible. And he forced them through trial and error and situation. He forced them every time, gave them exercises in faith to feed the 5,000. He told the disciples, you feed them. They said, well, where are we going to get food from? He was trying to see what they would do. When the storm occurred, he said, why, why are you fearful? It was a storm. And naturally, they had to be afraid. When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two to go raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons, what did he tell them? And this is really, really awesome. He told them, don't even take a bag on your trip. Don't take any money. Don't take any food. Don't take any change of clothes. Imagine that. You're going on a missions trip, and you say, don't take any money. Don't take any food. Don't even take a bag. Imagine you're not allowed to take a bag because you, you're forced to live by faith while you're witnessing, while you're telling people about the Lord, while you're out there doing the work of the Lord, you yourself, you're forced to live by faith and rely on the provision that God will provide through people on the mission field, or however he decides to provide you with that thing. So every, each and every step the disciples make, made a mighty man of God made required a step of faith that forced them not to accept naturalistic reasons or naturalistic interpretations of life but rather to see things at a higher plane but from a spiritual point of view to see the spirit of the thing not to see natural with natural eyes because if you refuse to see things with with the spiritual eyes and all we see is with natural eyes and we limit ourselves based on our natural perception of life, godliness, Christianity, the church, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, our destiny. If we would only see that through natural eyes, then that's no different from being what? Seeing things a demonic way because Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Hmm. Get thee behind me, Satan, because you refuse to see things spiritually you refuse to see why i came here and why i should die now if we look at it objectively we would say jesus had no reason to chastise him in that way well why did he get down on him because it's hard to perceive that the hope of salvation came to die and you got to look at the context in that time in that place these disciples this man came on the scene after 400 years of silence John the Baptist, we hear about this guy baptizing people, talking about somebody coming who's greater than me. This man showed up. He's a hope of Israel. Finally, we're going to come out from under the Roman uh, oppression over us. Um, he's our great hope. He's going to be our next king. He will replace the next emperor or whatever the case may be. And all of a sudden, he's talking about he's going to die. So, yes, I understand why Peter would see it naturally. And the Holy Spirit was not in him at that time, but the Holy Spirit was with him in the, as a person of Jesus Christ. So there was an anointing. Peter, ex, he was able to benefit or to, 
he was able to benefit from the, the umbrella of the anointing that was a pull on Jesus' life because Peter was able to cast out devils and heal the sick and the can't cleanse the left. They were sent to do that. And I say many mighty work took place through them because they operate under the umbrella of Christ's anointing, the Holy Spirit with them, through Christ, doing the works of Christ. And I understood why Peter would see that way. Yet still, he chastised him for not seeing it the way he saw it. And it was equivalent to seeing things the way Satan will see or the demonic will force you to perceive life. So many, many of us need deliverance from a demonic point of view, which is a naturalistic point of view. That's why these studies are called Life in the Spirit. It's a call to a higher place of perception. Now, perception is not a natural way of looking at things. Perception is a mental, emotional, it's a, it's a, it's a mind, uh, it's a, how can I say, it's a way your conscious will look. So the way you perceive something is the way you mentally see it. Things could be chaotic on the outside but the way you perceive it on the inside is like you know what there's a solution that god is going to turn this around for good that i am the solution to this problem god has have to download that in me i have to show up and the right words will come out the right actions will will i will end up doing the right thing to bring a solution in that matter it's all it's all about the way you perceive it and the more you live from the spirit the more you'll be able to perceive from the spirit and not look at life with your eyes but rather through your eyes and with your conscience so we are called to live from the spirit and if we don't live from the spirit live from the spiritual perception of life living from our conscience not with our eyes but rather seen with our conscience okay and our conscience is able to interpret our conscience is able to judge our conscience is able to determine that's living from your spirit, by the spirit, is able to judge. And you know exactly what you have to do because the Holy Spirit works with your conscience to bear his will on your mind. Always remember that. The Holy Spirit works with your conscience to bear his will on your mind so you would know and understand what is the will of God. God wants us to know his will. And what Paul said, I wish that you, 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 you have wisdom and you would know his perfect will that you would know. Um, he gives you the, the revelation is is when wisdom unfolds so that in your mind, their natural minds begin to understand in snippets spiritual truth so that you would know. So God wants us to know, but we have to interpret from our conscience. We have to begin to see from the inside out. We have to begin to judge from our, our gut, your spirits, your, your lower region, it's your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You got to think with your belly and not your head. No, that doesn't mean food. <laughs> but it's a different way of life. You understand what I'm saying? It's a call to a higher order of perception. It's a higher order, a higher way of seeing things. Now, unsaved people, people who are in the world, who are into like positive thinking and um, into motivation and those kind of like Tony Robbins and these kind of people who make, a, they make millions of dollars on telling people how not to see things in the, in the natural, but to see it in the eyes of faith and to perceive things the way you want it to be rather than the way it is. Imagine that. And guess what? They get results from that. Why? Because out of your heart flows the issues of life. If your heart perceives fear, if your heart is convicted of things are getting bad, then bad things is gonna they're gonna manifest all around you. But if your heart says things are getting better, if your heart says the church is becoming more powerful, if you say in your heart, if you conceive in your heart that the kingdom of God is growing, the kingdom of God is expanding, the church is growing, it's about to expand, it's about to go into all areas. We're about to spread out with power and might. People are gonna come into the house of the Lord rather than trust the institutions. They can't trust the government no more. They can't trust education no more. They can't trust uh, the economy and the businessman or the, min the minister of finance anymore to, to, to provide hope for us or to say things are going to get better and we'll be able to afford food and shelter and clothing and, and different things like that. For No. All these institutions are going to be shaken to the core so that people begin to look away from that. And finally, as, as a move of grace, as God's grace, to soften people's heart, to wake them up, because disappointment oftentimes wake up people 
more than just hitting them over the head with something. When people get disappointed a lot of times, then they begin to look away. Then they wake up. Then they realize, wait a minute, what I've been doing is not delivering. And that's where the world is at. But the only way we can sort of monopolize on it or we can make the best of the time and season or redeem the time is if we begin to really get the truth and the wisdom when it comes to walking in the spirit, from the spirit, by the spirit, and perceiving things in a spiritual way. You look at Jesus and look at the way he perceived life. Every story from the time he turned water into wine all the way into his death and his resurrection, all he did was perceive life in a, at a higher level. A spiritual level. He never gave himself over to naturalistic understanding. He never did that. All truth life. I study the word of the words of Christ because he fascinates me. Christ fascinates me because why? Not only he's God, not only he's a door, not only he's a he's a bread of life, not only he's the Lamb of God, not only he's our Savior, not only he's our Father. When we when we Jesus is the face of our Father. If you see, see, see me, you see the Father. I always say the Holy Spirit is a voice of God. Jesus is the face. And who sought a template that we should walk in. He created a pattern, a mold that we should fit in. And that mold is unlike anything else. If you want to know how to extrapolate wisdom, how you to how to live out truth, we know a lot about God because we sat in churches every week, we sat in Bible studies, we looked at YouTube videos. We know a lot about God, but how do we move from knowing to walking? You have to do it through the eyes of Christ. And he taught me how to walk in the spirit. We have to begin to perceive. This natural world, the way Christ perceived this natural world, and the way he did it is that he looked at it from a spiritual point of view, and it's full of faith, full of possibility, full of power. With God, all things are possible. And that's the beginning foundational truth when it comes to faith. In your heart, in your belly, you should be convinced, you should be fully persuaded, you should be convicted in your heart of hearts, deep in your gut, that with God, all things are possible. And guess what? God is with you, so therefore all things are possible. And Philippians 4.13 comes in, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means in your gut that you should know without a doubt, regardless of what's taking place, regardless of who is in power, regardless of if they lock you up in prison with, with God who is in you, all things are possible. So I want you to write that down or put that somewhere. Say, with God, all things are possible. This should be part of your operating system. This should be the foundational truth that drives you in the direction of God and to be a witness for him. Because one of the last words that Jesus spoke is that you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be witnesses, witnesses. Last words and first words are very important. The first words he spoke was to the disciples, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, souls, souls. I want people into the kingdom. His last words, I would anoint you. My power is going to come upon you so you could be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. God sent Jesus to make disciples, to become ambassadors, to reconcile man back to God. And all of us in this room tonight, each and every one, we're disciples to reconcile man back to God. Mm. We get blessed in the process, of course. We get our needs met. We begin to live the overcoming life. We are privileged to be part of his salvation effort to get man back to the Father, because that's a primary reason that Jesus came, is to get man back to the Father. Man was alienated from their father. They left the home like the prodigal son. We facilitate that prodigal son's return into father's house. That's our primary role when it comes to our assignment here on earth. Not just to get blessed, not just to receive his love. We get all that. 
in the process of doing his will. We get all that while we're part of the Great Commission, yes. But the, at the end of the day, after we receive all we can, after we receive all his love and all his blessings, after we've been pumped up by Christ, is to what? Is to go out. Is to go out and be who we're called to be, ambassadors. To represent the kingdom of God, because what ambassadors do, they represent another country. We're from another country. We're from the kingdom of heaven. We're from another kingdom, basically, a kingdom of heaven. And we come from the kingdom of heaven to show people how to live in the kingdom of heaven while they live on earth. But how do we get there? What we know about God has to be doable. And we see through the person of Christ. And only as we walk in the spirit, from the spirit, are we able to walk like Jesus. So number one, and this is where application comes in. I said a lot tonight. Now we're going to say how. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Number one, part of your operating system is for you to be convinced that all things are possible. Now, if you're convinced that all things are possible through God, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, okay? If I'm convinced that nothing is impossible with me because of who lives in me, greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. If those things are not a conviction in my belly, then you would suffer and you would be miserable as a Christian. You would be a miserable Christian because things will happen in your life because the Holy Spirit loves you and he wants you to come to the truth. And everything that the Holy Spirit does Okay, is not to give you convenience or comfort, but rather allow situations in your life to bring you into the truth. Do you know you could exempt yourself from struggle if you should willingly just obey and allow the Holy Spirit to just impregnate you with his truth by just downloading and meditating on the truth till it actually becomes part of you? That's what Jesus did. That's what a mighty man and woman of God, they didn't get mighty and powerful in the Lord just overnight. No, they'll tell you about the time they took, spent meditating on the truth till the truth became part of who they are. So it takes time each and every day. If you find yourself voicing or verbalizing doubt, that means... As the Bible said, out of your heart flows the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means you're not fully convinced as yet that all things are possible with you because of the, the one who lives inside of you. You're not demonstrating the truth. You're not convicted of the truth, but rather you're convicted of a lie. So we're not called as Christians to speak impossibilities or doubt. All things are possible. So we have to change the way we speak from now on. Not only meditate on the word, all the word that increases our faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, but we have to change the way we speak, and which is we have to refuse to voice doubt. Now, Peter could have think about his response to Jesus and say, well, I don't understand this fully, and it's, it's a conversation he's having in his mind, but I'm going to just believe because with what I've seen so far, I've walked with this man for so many years now, maybe a year and a half or however long it was, he walked till that statement was made that you're not going to suffer. And when he was rebuked for saying that, he could have thought that thing, but you don't necessarily have to voice that thing because you just give it over to choice, to, to, to trust. To That's what we take every thought captive. Not everything that comes to your mind, you should speak. Now, some people need to hear that, right? Hmm. Not everything that comes to your mind means you should voice, you should speak. We 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 speak. We curse ourselves with these words of doubt, and we we we. How can I say? It? We bind ourselves to naturalistic results because of our words. When God wants to give you the impossible, I always say, fools do as much as they can. Fools attempt as much as they can. Those who believe in Christ Jesus attempts the impossible and accomplish it. Because whatever God calls you to, and I always say this, he will call you. It will require his faith because he will always call you to an impossible situation. If God calls you to a situation that's possible, then you don't require any faith. faith. You don't need his intervention in it. 
He would never do that because God will allow you to go through things in order to cause you to arrive at a place where you have to trust him. But you could exempt yourself from struggle should you just trust him on the offset. Just trust him. After the session tonight, just write down those scriptures. It has to do with trust in God or have to do with all things are possible with God. All things are, just believe, all things are possible. Just believe. Over and over and over, Jesus chastised his disciples to say, all things are possible. All you need is faith is a mustard seed. Your faith has made you whole. Just trust. Just believe. Why it's so hard to trust God? Why it's so hard to believe God for the impossible? Because we live in a world where we live by sight and not faith. We live in a world where it's easier to give into your doubt because it's work to swim against the tide to push against the grain, to go against everybody's perception of you and expectation of you because we're so into pleasing people and becoming and conforming. It's easier to conform than to be separated from the crowd. The reason why so many people are not successful is because there's no competition for success. There are very few people that are successful because a few people go against the crowd. Few people strive and go against the grain. Few people get this and go all the way. But we don't have to be that. We could be the majority of people who are who have faith. We could be the one church that when God comes, when the soft man returns, you can say, indeed, this church is full of faith because they trust me according to my words and they trust me according to the work I have done in them. And that should be the kind of people we are. And because that's why we want to have these sessions so we could begin to develop a culture of faith and and push aside the culture of doubt. So the next time you meet and you talk about the country and say, yeah, we know what's going on in this country, but guess what? There's a power. There's authority. There are saints of God who are waking up and realizing what they should do in this time and this hour, and which is to pray. To pray against the will of the enemy. So I wanted initially to, to read Ezekiel 9. Maybe you could read it in your in your time. But I'll finish with faith and as a homework. And we'll do speak about this next week. Ezekiel 9. It will be an awesome session as a homework. Ezekiel 9. Only a couple of verses in there. Just read that. And it's a great story about what we should do in this time. But going back to faith. Number one again. All things are possible with you. So begin to change your conversation. Begin to speak with trust. Speak with anticipation. Speak with making a room to accommodate abundance. Speak with possibilities. And stop speaking doubt. Stop speaking doubt. Stop cursing yourself and binding yourself to naturalistic results. Because you bind yourself to this world a naturalistic result, you will only get what the world thinks you should get based on what you have and what you did. Hmm. We don't live, you see, as Christians, we don't get wealth by labor, but wealth comes by favor. We don't get wealth by labor, wealth comes by favor. A thousand years of hard labor is worth one day of favor. If you live committed, trust in God, anticipating results in the kingdom of God, doing the work of the kingdom, which is the Great Commission, speaking about the good news of Christ, just lifting up Jesus everywhere you go, being aware of the presence of God in you, seeing yourself as part of the solution, not part of the problem, seeing that when you show up, God will use you to bring might and power and solutions and provision and healing and deliverance and wholeness in every situation because that's who Jesus was and that's who you are. Who Jesus was is who I am. If you see yourself that way, then you nothing will be impossible to you. God will be glorified. Many will come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And you would prosper in every good work. In every good work, you will prosper. And this this has to be a conviction. That nothing is impossible with me. Nothing is impossible with me. Nothing is impossible with me because of Jesus. So you write that down. The second thing I want to talk about real quick before we end. Is that no matter what happens. What the Bible said. He will turn all things around for good. 
basically he will give you double for your trouble, double for your shame. Whatever the enemy meant for harm, no matter what it looks like, if it's allowed in your life, is there for a setup for something better. Always understand that. Is there for a setup for something better. I've seen many mighty men and women of God who love God with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength, who did a lot of good works for Christ. Longer than I have, they've, they've lived the exemplary life and they suffered loss. We can't question that because God in his wisdom sees these things way different from the way we see it. His ways are higher than our ways. We don't question God because something bad happened. No, you thank him that you're alive and you thank him and then begin to trust and say, God, you're going to turn this around for good. Even though I can't see anything good that comes from it. Even though this makes no sense whatsoever, God. Even though I think with all my heart and mind and strength, this should never happen. I refuse to see it naturalistically because that's a demonic way of looking at things. And I will thank you for the the goodness that will come out of this from me, for me as your son or your daughter and the glory that this will bring to you in some way it will translate later on that will bring you glory. Even though I can't see it naturalistically, we can't see it naturalistically. So you thank God for the good times, you thank him in the bad times. I love to have good times. I love to have more good times than bad times. But guess what? When something bad happened, it's not going to stop me from thanking the Lord. No, I'm going to anticipate my blessing. I say, Lord, every time something bad happens to me, it's a setup for double. Make that your mantra. Make that your 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 pack you make with him. I love making packs with God because he actually holds his end of the bargain. Even though I fail and I break it a lot of times, he holds his. He God remains faithful when we are faithless. God remains faithful when we are not faithful. God holds his covenant even though we are covenant breakers. God keeps his covenant because he looks to Jesus and see you are worthy. And I can keep my covenant even though you break it. I'm still going to keep covenant even though you walk away. I love you despite your love for me. He sees it because he sees what Christ did for you. He holds Christ over you. And he puts Christ's image over you and he sees Christ in you. He doesn't see your sin. He sees. Once you have Christ in you, oh, it's amazing what grace is. Grace makes no sense. So don't even try to understand grace. Some people try to understand grace and they mess it up. Grace makes no sense. So realize that no matter what happens to you, God will turn it around for good. And if something bad does happen, even if you don't agree with it, you don't like it, you think it shouldn't have happened, guess what? He will turn it around for good, for your good and his glory. So you got to say this yourself. Whatever happens to me, whether it's good or bad, if, if any bad things happens to me, God's going to turn it around for my good and his glory. I want you to say that. If any bad things happen to me, God is going to turn it around for my good and his glory. And you have to be convinced of that truth because that's what help you to walk in the spirit, from the spirit. So regardless of what happens, God knows it. He sees it. And the good thing about it is that I believe that a lot of times God would allow certain things to happen because he, he wants to give us double. God would allow certain things to happen to us sometimes because he wants to bless us more than we can receive that blessing. Because he loves to do double. Because you know why? You know why God loves to do that? Because he loves to make the enemy look like a fool. We saw that on the cross. Where the enemy thought he had Jesus. And we finally killed him and betrayed him. And did all this conduct and all this chess game. And all this strategizing. And the enemy strategized. And he finally thought he won. But he's so blind and stupid. Not knowing he played right into the plan of God. That ultimately all the sins of this world. We absorbed into Christ once and for all, so we never have to pay for sin again. We are free forever because of the sacrifice of one man. For us, the price paid forever. Now, the past and the future, all paid 2,000 years ago. So God oftentimes judges the enemy through the hardship or the situation that the enemy might have done in our lives. He uses that now to give us double for our shame. And then to Look at the enemy and say, hey, look what you did. But look what I did. What you meant for harm, I turn it around for good. Amen? What the enemy meant for harm, God turned it around for good. 
You as a Christian should be the most positive person on the face of the earth. You should never be negative. You should never anticipate hardship or failure. Even though we go through failure, it's a setup. Failure is a setup for double. You have to be convinced of that. Every time something bad happens to me, happened to me over the years, and a lot of bad things happened to me over the years. A lot of things I trusted God with, I anticipated, I hoped for, failed. It failed miserably. I went into debt. Things didn't work. And I was in the middle of healing people, bringing people to Christ, involving so many ministries and just things. But things were great in the kingdom, but in, in life, it was going crappy. And I was like, whatever I put my hands to, it seemed like it wasn't working. But guess what happened? Through that, I met people that all of a sudden lately became an avenue through which God gave me not only double, but triple for what I've lost in those years. Because why? Every failure is an opportunity that God gives me to get double. Every failure is a setup to get double. Everything the enemy meant for harm, God's going to turn it around for good and slap the devil in his face with it. And I love to see when the devil gets slapped in the face with what he thought was meant for my harm that God turned around for good. That should be the encouragement. We should be excited about, I'm not saying excited about hardship, and stress and disease and sickness, even sickness. If it should come your way, it's like, oh yeah, you want to come? I'll show you how God's going to use this for my good and his glory. And when you come out of it, he slaps the enemy in his face and say, you, you're the author of, of sickness? Guess what? Look what I did. And you get a healing anointing after you get healed. So I will operate in a system. How do we live in the spirit? How do we allow faith to reign in our life? Is to know that all things are possible through Christ. We should never verbalize doubt, no matter how naturalistic. Well, we say you have to accept the facts, or you have to be real. You know, you have to see it. You have to call it out. You can't. You can't uh, avoid it. Yes, you. You can acknowledge facts, but every fact is an opportunity to be trumped by faith. So we acknowledge facts. We say, okay, the hand is broken. Okay. I understand that. All right. This is an opportunity now to pray a prayer of faith where the sick shall be healed. You get what I'm saying? So you don't want to be a, a fact denier. No, you could acknowledge fact without entering into fear. I could say something is bad without entering into the fear, but I use it as an opportunity to speak faith. I use it as an opportunity to trust God for the solution. You get what I'm saying? Some people are afraid to say, don't say it, it will happen. So you feel sick, you're dying, and you don't, you're don't. you afraid to tell anybody you're sick. You're, no, you could tell your neighbor, say, hey, I'm telling you not because I want you to feel sorry for me. I'm telling you because I want you to stand in prayer. Let's pray till this thing go away. I refuse to accept this sickness because no plague shall come near my dwelling. And this is living by faith. When the Son of Man comes back, will he really find faith in this world? All you find a bunch of Christians lined up trying to take a COVID shot because they're scared they die. They can't trust God. They want to trust that. That's a personal decision you make. But I'm trusting God. I don't care. Because I want my legacy, just like in Hebrews 11, even if you don't receive the thing that you trust in God for, what will be spoken about you from now till eternity is that you trusted God, which speaks louder, which is greater in rewards and legacy than actually receiving the thing you're trusting for. You understand that? God wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust him. And many of us don't trust God because we don't really know his love. Because that fear, which hasn't been driven up by his perfect love, caused you to not trust. So what do you say? You pray the love of the Father will flood your hearts and heal your hearts so you can begin to know him. You can begin to trust him. You can begin to live by faith and you can see the impossible. Remember when Jesus healed, I think it was Jairus' daughter. And she was presumed dead. She was dead. The people there say, what are you doing? She's dead. It's too late. And what did he do? He drove out the people from the room because 
something about doubt, something about people who see things naturalistically hinders the manifestation of the miraculous. God, God, he, Jesus had to drive those people out of there because it did something with the atmosphere. You can, I don't understand this fully, but what I do know is that when you have a room full of people who doubt, it's difficult, not impossible, but difficult for the supernatural to manifest. What does that tell me? If my church is filled with people full of faith and anticipation, miraculous things are going to happen in that church. But if your church has a bunch of people who are inflicted with fear and inflicted with doubt and don't really trust God, then guess what? It's difficult. It's not impossible. There are times where God will show up despite the difficulties. But guess what? We hinder the supernatural manifestation of God, which result in blessings and deliverance and freedom and abundance. So the onus is upon us tonight. And this is a prophetic call. I never anticipated I was going to speak this way. I wanted to speak about Ezekiel 9, as you can see. But I'm speaking with passion and zeal and conviction about this word. It's, it's onus is upon us to be a people who would anticipate the move of God. Who would expect God to show up. Who would know that God would make give us double for our trouble. Not for people who would just wallow and cry about what happened to us or what shouldn't happen to us and we are forced by God we were compelled by the Holy Spirit impelled by the Holy Spirit on the inside compelled by the word on the outside we we beckon to to see things in a spiritual way to see things in anticipation with hope with possibilities that even though the girl is dead he would say she's asleep because Jesus refused to even use a terminology to describe the fact of the situation. But the real, because spiritual truth is higher than physical truth. So the natural truth is, the spiritual truth is that she is alive. And she's always alive. But guess what? We're going to make her alive in this world for a little bit longer. Let's get that spirit back into that body. And let's get her awake because she's really asleep. Jesus refused to even verbalize naturalistic limitations. How much more should we do the same? And how much are we really hindering God? Manifest in our family, manifest in our church, manifest in our life because of our unbelief, because of our doubt, because we refuse to anticipate the blessings of God. We refuse to anticipate the goodness of God. Today is the day, you should say. Today is the day that we refuse, that we refuse to see things naturalistically and we will see things with anticipation. We'll see things with possibilities. We'll see things through the eyes of the Spirit and see that God has a plan. And every discouragement, every trial is a setup for success and is a setup where His goodness can be manifested in your life and He can receive the glory. Amen? God bless you. Bishop, take over there before we keep going.